Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A hostile crowd, I see. <laughs> uh, I'm so sorry to be late, um, and I, when I heard, I kept on calling my friend Allie Lutz, uh, who's here today. She's at YDS. By the way, we do want her back. <laughs> um, and I kept on calling and saying, we're on exit. And every time I named an exit, it would disappoint Allie, who would say, oh, you're just fine. You're right on time. And then they said, well, we have... And I'm actually traveling, if you can believe it, with my close friend, Jenny Block, who is a theologian. And like the dean of this school, an expert on early Christianity. And in, just to show you what a good Christian woman she is, when she found out that Nicholas was playing, she said, well, we don't want you to be upstaged. Get someone bad as a first act. <laughs> so thank you. We're, we're, I don't know where you went, but thank you so much for, for covering, getting my back with beautiful music. Um, I have to admit that when I chose this rather highfalutin title for this talk, I knew that I would live to regret it. I have, um, I, I think actually the Protestant, this place is so dominated by Protestants, you guys don't you know, torture children like you do in my church, which I won't mention by name, but which is older than yours. <laughs> and I remember we had to learn the corporal works of mercy. But to be really frank, I, I never understood why it was important to think about the corporal works of mercy uh, until I became, uh, until I went to, to Haiti, and, and really being a doctor has, has been a terrific teacher. Actually, one of my um, friends from medical school who's here, Dr. Albert Coe, Dr. Coe, guess what, Dr. Coe, who looks to this day looks annoyingly young, when we were in medical school, we went to a little village in central Haiti. First of all, I will point out that Dr. Coe and I, I would say we don't look very much alike. Um, we went to a village where I had worked for some years in the middle of central Haiti, a place called Kai Pam. I'm sure Ali has been there. And a man that I had known for some years came up to me and looked at Albert and looked at me and said, I was 20 maybe 26 years old, and so, so is Albert. And he said, is that your son? And I, and I said, no, it's my grandson. He didn't laugh either. Anyway, so I knew I would be in for trouble um, talking about the corporal works of mercy if I didn't stick close to uh, my own work, our own work. As, as Diana said, it's really not the work of an individual person. And that's a very misleading thing to think that one person or even a hundred people could do the kind of work that I will be describing today. It really does require uh, partnerships every step along the way. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the good partners we've, we, we've been lucky enough to have. I want to start, though, and this is my nod to the fact that we're at YDS and uh, that my friend who is uh, studying here, Ali Lutz, who was program coordinator and I believe is still program coordinator for the Haiti Projects. Special, a uh, new, new title. Um, anyway, I've, I, I just want to, uh, I do want to acknowledge a debt um, to uh, theology, especially to liberation theology, which taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about those lessons I never seemed to pick up when I was a kid, um, being told by my devoutly atheistic father, you have to go to Mass. I said, but wait, well, why? He said, just shut up and do what I say, not what I do, which is something I didn't pick up in my parenting later on. But it was really as an adult that I learned uh, a little bit about theology. And Haiti taught me a lot. This um, man who's being quoted here, Gustavo Gutierrez, is another one of my friends and teachers. And I was lucky enough to work in uh, his country, Peru. Many of you have read his works um, or know his work, um, he's uh, happily enough for all of us alive and well, so-called father of liberation theology. I'm sure he would never use that term himself. And I was able to teach with him at Notre Dame last fall, which was 
pretty fun at 20 years after meeting the guy. Um, I, I'm sure none of this is recorded or broadcast, but I will tell you that we, we, we did call him Yoda behind his back. <laughs> it's a little fellow. Anyway, um, he's a great teacher. Um, and, uh, and, and not just through his written works, which are lead up to great piles of books, one stacked against the other, over the other, um, but also through his, his work as a, as a parish priest in a place not too far from here. This is a picture um, taken in a place called Carabayo, and some of my friends who are here have been worked there as well. But reading, reading this kind of work uh, in a setting like rural Haiti or Caraballo is makes all the difference. Now, of course, theologians do say that, and I later picked, picked up an interest, as I said, in liberation theology and some of its insights um, or some of the applications one might use in medicine. I just want to go back to some obvious stuff and then talk a little bit about our work in Haiti. One of the things, one of the seven corporal works of mercy, uh, I was to visit the prisoners is it visit the prisoners? I should have gotten this right, more or less. And again, I had no idea what that meant. In my experience growing up in Florida, there, there was really only one way to visit a prison, and it was not a good way. But of course, there are really two ways. And um, one of the reasons I'm lucky enough to work with, a, uh, with partners who, who actually have respect for, they might not call my, this is, you know, Partners in Health is a, is a secular organization, of course. They, my coworkers might not use the term corporal works of mercy, and in fact don't. But in, in Haiti, one of the things I learned that first year there, I was 23 years old, had graduated from college and was headed to medical school, and I remember following a patient to prison. And, uh, and, and, and I told this story at Notre Dame, I'd never, never, told this story before, uh, but I remember being 23 years old, and I was actually staying in the rectory of a church. I still work with these people. Uh, this was an Episcopalian church, or as we used to call them when I was a kid, the Atiscatalians. They're in plentiful numbers here in New Haven, I'm told. And I just remember hearing these people chanting in the street um, as they carried this woman off to prison for sorcery. And it was very disturbing to me. And I, I was happened to be by myself just hearing this, what they were saying that, you know, this woman had, had eaten two children. And uh, it, it bothered me a great deal. It bothered me also that I didn't feel that I could talk about how it bothered me. And years later, 30 years later, I was asked uh, uh, in, a, in a conference in Los Angeles about Haiti. This was after the earthquake. I was asked to tell a story that I hadn't told, and I still found myself censoring out that story because it was so disturbing. I didn't feel like I could tell it correctly. And, but I did go to the prison um, that year to visit, to see patients who had run afoul of the law, or most of them, of course, had never been tried. This is a big problem to this day in Haiti, and I find out in many other places. And one of them uh, was and is Russia. But this is really a story, the whole story I'm going to tell, a story we might call, it's really one of, of good outcomes. And in Russia as well, the reason I ended up there uh, was because I had developed a clinical expertise in drug-resistant tuberculosis, again because of a patient. And, uh, and it's a very, uh, a very rare disease. I think there's probably fewer than couple hundred cases of tuberculosis in Massachusetts now, although it was once the leading cause of death of young adults in Massachusetts, as it was in the world until it was surpassed by HIV. And I remember going to the prison and, and seeing uh, a patient, young man, um, who was sick with tuberculosis and died, um, and, and then saying, well, maybe this is an area where I could learn how to be at least a good doctor. And back to Diana. Diana was good enough uh, to mention I ended up writing a lot about this. So my interest in health and human rights comes not from some theoretical perspective, but rather from just following the pathology. As Gustavo Gutierrez wouldn't use that term, follow the pathology, he uses other, very, to me, very similar 
metaphors, but just following the pathology will lead you, as he says, into these slums and squatter settlements and prisons and, and backwaters in places like rural Haiti. And I have to say that that's how I ended up in, in a Russian prison. The, every time I would go into this particular prison, this is not the prison where we ended up working, but another one not too far away, I kept on thinking, you know, there are, there are other ways to get in prison other than going in as a doctor who happens to have expertise in what we thought would be a rare disease. Anyway, I want to tell this, start with this positive story. Um, uh, uh, one of the corporal works of mercy, as I said, is to visit the prisoners. Now, if you're a doctor, uh, I would imagine that if you're a doctor and you're go or nurse, I say doctor, I mean nurse, I mean any clinician, looking at a nurse friend of mine. I, she would have corrected me later if I had not corrected myself. But if you're visiting prisoners and you have some medical expertise, then, and the prisoners happen to be sick, then I would say a simple visit's not a really good idea. You know, the mother, the, let their mother visit them, all right? You need to visit and, and, and intervene. And I learned a lot from this, uh, of this in Haiti, not in Russia, but by the time I went to Peru, where that first picture was taken, um, I, I was the TB guy, actually Jim Kim, who some of you may have heard of. <laughs> well, this is going to be an interesting decade, isn't it? Not to be arcane, Jim Kim is going to be the head of the World Bank. Um, yeah, I mean, that's like very exciting to me. <laughs> Can't believe it. Anyway, in, the, in our little family division of labor, off Jim goes to Peru. I went there all the time too. My, and, uh, but one of the first things that happened is that we started seeing patients who were not responding to conventional therapy for tuberculosis. So I got called in again. Actually, I hope this memo was forever lost. But I remember writing something saying, well, you know, whatever we do in Peru as our work as partners, in health, I think we should focus on women's health and a couple of other uh, problems. But I'm sure we won't have to focus on tuberculosis because they have a great TB program. But of course, there's always a problem with any program. I'm not talking about a TB program. Any intervention. Um, I, was, I, I was teaching in a very small class at NYU. A friend of mine's teaching a public policy class. And somebody's cheering for NYU already over there. And, uh, and we're just talking about the difference between programmatic work, which is the best kind of work we can do in medicine, right? Build a whole program. Right? But there's always flaws in a program. And understanding what those might be is a constant challenge in medicine and public health. And I'm sure other people in other fields feel the same way. In any case, back to this story, the flaw was that the, the inexpensive and excellent manag managerial platform that had been advanced to treat MDR -TB, or T tuberculosis obviously doesn't work if the antibiotics don't work. And so these poor lot um, had drug-resistant tuberculosis. And the, the interesting thing about this experience for me was a lot of the people we work with in Russia actually, of course, knew this. And it turns out that all the arguments against doing the right thing clinically all turned about cost-effectiveness and an uncritical reading of cost-effectiveness. A friend of mine was a professor here at Yale for many years, one of my best friends from college, a guy named Han Saucy. I don't know if any, any of you ever met him. Too bad if you didn't, because he is the smartest man in the world. I don't know why Yale let him go. Anyway, he edited um, a, a book of my writings, which is a pretty nice thing to have your college chum do, right? Edit a whole reader. He said, let's call it the Paul Farmer Reader. Of course, my friends from Partners in Health said, you can't have a book called the Paul Farmer Reader. You have to be 80 years old at least to do that. That was not supported. But he did edit this, and he wrote, he's a professor of comp lit, and he wrote about cost effectiveness from a very different point of view as the central, uh, really, part of our work. That is, it's really a response to this idea that it's going to be easy to apply some simple logic to very complex problems. And that's why I keep going back to things, not so much philosophy about which I know very little, but I find theology can be very grounding. I don't know how many of you here are at Divinity School or uh, probably the front rows. 
Um, but I, I found it very helpful in my work. What, one of the things we did in this instance in Russia is to say, well, um, we're going to have it. People go to prison as their punishment, not for punishment. So you wouldn't want people inside a prison to have lower standards of health care than outside the prison. That just seems so obvious to me. And in fact, if you take liberation theology, when this, this idea of preferential option for the poor is so radical compared to any ideology you can think of, because it says that you should not only take care of the poor, you should actually take better care of the poor. And, you know, it may be obvious to some of you who are theologians, but I have never seen that really applied in medicine and public health. Not in the United States, not in... Not anywhere, that I, and in the many places I've gone and worked. So what we said with our, our Russian colleagues is, well, we need the right treatment. They said, absolutely. And then we said, we need the right standard of care. And they said, oh, we agree. And who was not agreeing? It was, it was experts who leaned so heavily on the, the modern theology of public health. Did you know there's a modern theology of public health? It's this cost-effectiveness analysis that is misapplied. Now, we made a, a number of phrase, fairly straightforward points. The last time I was at Yale, I talked about this as regards the prices of AIDS medications. How can you make an announcement, a pronouncement rather, on cost effectiveness of AIDS treatment when you don't understand either cost or effectiveness? Actually, the reason I'm tardy, I will blame someone else, is I won't mention him by name, but he was once the president of this country, and he likes to talk. And he likes to talk about drug pricing. That's all I'm going to say. So this, this, it's almost, the, like I said, a modern theology. And not, I don't mean that as a compliment. I mean, the modern ideology of public health is so dominated by cost effectiveness without the critical analysis of either cost or effectiveness. We're in the middle of a cholera epidemic in Haiti. And I am routinely asked by journalists, well, how much does the vaccine cost? And I, I found myself answering, and to some hapless stringer, I told him, it costs whatever you want it to. I said, excuse me, Dr. Farmer, are you still there? Tick, tick, tick. And I, I realized that that just didn't make sense at all to him, that the price of a vaccine, how much does a polio vaccine cost? How much does a measles vaccine cost? It costs whatever we want it to. Because it's all related to, unless it has something, I, I was asking the manufacturers, what, is there something in there like platinum or diamonds that are hard to get? Or, you know, ancient Sumerian tablets that are really running low in supply? Again, that is another tactic that I found not very helpful. Sarcasm <laughs> never gets you anywhere. Anyway, so what we did was go into this prison at the, at the you know, like I said, there are two ways to get into a prison. And this is not this prison, but another one in Siberia. And by the way, uh, this place, I, I, I'm nuts about this place in Siberia. Believe it or not, I really am nuts. It's a place called Tomsk in western Siberia. Has anybody ever been to Tomsk? So I've never met anyone outside Tomsk who's been to Tomsk. <laughs> but there's even some... Anyway, it's quite beautiful, uh, as, as a lot of Siberia is. And, um, and they, the people in Tomsk... I mean, I, I had a lot of uh, revelations working in Russia after working in Haiti and even in, in, in Peru. Uh, the first time I met to, I, mean, I went to this town, it's actually a city, and there was a medical school there that was 450 years old. And um, I made the mistake of saying to a doctor, who, by the way, I'm told was the former Miss Siberia, and I believed it. <laughs> but I said to her, wow, you guys have, you know, a metro, you know, uh, and she said, what did you expect, bears in the streets? <laughs> so I realized that, again, my training in anthropology had been helpful. <laughs> but, so, we went into this prison, and again, uh, we tried to do the corporal works of mercy in the sense of visit the prisoners, but expertly. Um, and um, that's, that's what, I'm, I'm looking at one of my protégés, Koji Nakashima, um, who is a physician who I met uh, when he was still a, a med student. And we were talking after the earthquake. He's a great doctor. Um, 
And we were just talking about, and I remember saying to him, I went into the, I hadn't been out of the earthquake zone up to central Haiti where I'd been working for so long, and I walked into the, the village where a number of us have worked together. It's not a village anymore. It looked, used to be a squatter settlement. More on that in a second. And I walked into the church, and the church had, was a huge, you know, as big as this church, big church, and it had been converted completely into a casualty ward. And everybody was lying on the floor. It was very quiet and clean and I just looked at, Ko at Koji and I said wow this is what I would call expert mercy and there were surgeons everywhere and anesthesiologists and a lot of obviously Haitian anyway back to Tomsk where is Nicholas when I needed to play the piano or something for a second so back to Tomsk the problem was getting the laboratory uh, analysis right and the meds and the case fatality rate inside this prison of people already on treatment was 26 percent. So that meant a quarter of all the people with starting treatment were dying and that should be zero just like with cholera case fatality rate should be zero. Right? Nobody should get cholera uh, but if you do get cholera you ought not to die from it and so it, so it is the case with tuberculosis. And there are a lot of naysayers, again, all on the grounds of cost-effectiveness. It wasn't cost-effective. There's got to be some other way. And again, this almost never came from my Russian colleagues. I, I, don't, I don't recall that. I mean, I, I, they were mostly Americans and Europeans who were so confident about this. One of them uh, was a, uh, who was saying there's got to be another way uh, beyond treatment. And I said, well, what I exactly? You know, what, what do you do if you... What are the alternatives to treatment? And I have heard this my whole life now, of course. I was pretty prepared by then. I've heard it about pediatric cancer in Africa. I've heard about AIDS. I've heard about drug-resistant TB. You name it. If it costs a lot, it's too much for the poor. But in any case, we, we were quite tired of arguing, but we did go into the prison system where they were using the wrong treatments recommended by experts. And, and I can tell you what, what happened is I just got these... This, these data, but first of all, in one year, uh, in this, I didn't find this out till year, years later. I should have been paying closer t attention, but in the first year, the ca case fatality rate went to zero. And then this part of Siberia, and again, claims of causality. I'm supposed to be ca careful about making them extravagantly, but in this part of Siberia, where, which had the highest rates of TB. I just got this from uh, a friend of mine who is a, who's a Russian TB doctor. I met him all those years ago. I've been working with him 15 years. He still sends me notes in Russian, in Cyrillic, as if I could understand a single word. Anyone, he, so I, get, I, I did get a note from the other day with blah, 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 exclamation point. Those are international. <laughs> and I, just, just to, it doesn't matter that much, but Tomsk, as you can see, you, all of Siberia, what's happened now is Tomsk, this oblast, has lower rates of TB than, than all Russia, including some of the wealthier parts of Russia. Now, the, I, well, I've already told you we can obviously make claims about case fatality rates of your own patients. That is, how many of you people you start on treatment die. That, that's quite a legitimate claim. But I would guess that some of this is related to integrated prevention and control inside the prisons and outside. It was actually easier to work in the prisons. Much easier. I mean, I hate to say it that way, especially in Yale Divinity School, but it's kind of nice when you have a captive audience as patients. In fact, I at once asked a prison official when someone was almost done with his treatment, I, I did, I must, might as well confess like we do in the the church I grew up in, that I said, couldn't we prolong his sentence just like by a month? <laughs> the Russians were appalled. <laughs> we thought you were a human rights doctor, they said. I said, okay, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, so Corporal Works of Mercy learned a lot about this in Haiti, but as Diana was generous enough to say, I believe these lessons, and I'm going to focus on Haiti now, are applicable in the United States, where we were also working with people who have fallen through the cracks um, in the shadows of the teaching hospitals where 
of Harvard Medical School. You'll find people living in poverty who have a different set of social pathologies, perhaps, or, or comorbid disease. Maybe they're addicted to drugs. Maybe they do, they're homeless. But you always find that these diseases run together with social pathologies. In Haiti, it's hunger. In, in Russia, it's, it's a, alcoholism, for example. But in every case, what I've seen is we're way too give, quick to give up on people who are marginalized by poverty. Now, back to, to my own, my own uh, trajectory, which, as Diana said, is never a personal trajectory. She didn't say it that way, but that's how I took it. I was lucky enough, as I said, to go to Kanjan. Uh This is a picture probably from 1984. That's what it says. But I, it, I know that it, it's, it must be 1985 because um, Koji, you, you're looking at this. That's, that's Friendship House, yeah, which we built in 1980. So it would be 1984. But the reason I'm talking about, uh, talking about using Gustavo Gutierrez here is in the background of this photograph, you'll see why we started this work in the squatter settlement. It's because of a development project. And what a, I started my career as a clinician, again, now this is before medical school, the best place you can ever start to work in public health is in a squatter settlement of landless peasants. Now that sounds like another extravagant claim, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to say why I believe that's true. It's because that's where you learn, obviously you learn about the value, hopefully you've learned about the value of life a little bit before medical school starts. But you also learn to be very critical of claims of causality, of claims about how much something costs, and about whether or not it's effective. I mean, I just went, came from a meeting, as I said, with an unnamed former president, Looking, we look critically at some of the spending that, that has been done on, on AIDS. Um, thank God, he said inside a church with a flentrop organ, that we have some resources finally going into AIDS, right, which we still have yet to do for surgical disease, for cancer, etc. Thank God we have some, but some of it goes to really hokey prevention work for which there's very limited... Uh, data. Meanwhile, the argument that actually treatment could help prevention was ridiculed for years, just as it was ridiculed that you could treat highly drug-resistant tuberculosis in a Siberian prison, just as people will tell you with a great deal of confidence that it's not cost-effective to treat leukemia in Rwanda. I mean, like I said, I've heard it all, and the longer that you stay in the work, the more likely you are to hear these arguments. Now, I said that a squatter settlement is the best place. I actually doubt Albert's ever heard me give a talk like this before, but we lived some of it together. I think a squatter settlement is the best place to learn about how to be critical of whatever public health ideology is au courant because people there have lost their means of production. So you see in the background a hydroelectric, you don't see the dam, but you see the reservoir. Kanj is nothing other than a squatter settlement formed when people left that flooded valley. And they told me, uh, and again, I was a credulous 23-year-old, that they left the valley on the day the water rose. But I wasn't so credulous that I said, oh, come on, you've got to be exaggerating. You mean, you know, you got, they, they would say, well, we just grabbed the kids and the goats and off we went as the water's lapping behind you up the mountain. And then I heard the same story again and again. I realized they weren't even exaggerating, that that's really how it happened. And, and later on, when I was a, a, in graduate school, I, as, as Diana mentioned, I did, I did graduate studies in anthropology, which is why I have such excellent and fluent Russian, and Kinyarwandan, and Chichewa. People say to me, oh, you have such a gift for languages. And of course I say, that's not true. I took all the easy ones. Spanish, Haitian, it's all the same. Anyway... In the squatter settlement, people have lost their ability to raise their families. They don't have land, and, they, and that's what they did. So learning to be sometimes a quiet you know, critic, I think the quiet part is sometimes good and sometimes not. The, it's not only the 25th anniversary, by the way, of Partners in Health, but also of ACT UP, uh, one of our biggest allies in the fight for global health equity. So I, I don't know if there are any representatives here today. I, I hope so. Um, 
But we, we really had to figure this out. And it started for me in a very bad clinic. Not in this town, but in another one. In fact, I'll tell you the name of the town. It's not a secret. Mirabale. I'm just curious. Who here has ever been to Mirabale? So, goodly number. So, Mirabale, I, I don't know what, what year did you come to Haiti and were mistaken for my son? We were so ugh, you missed all the hard years, Albert. This is it's the thing about those Yale professors. Even when he was at Harvard, we knew he was going to be a Yale professor. <laughs> they shirked their duties. <laughs> anyway, so uh, in, the, in, the, in the early 80s, uh, in that year, 1983, I went to a, a, a clinic in the town of Mirabale, and it was a nightmare, and I didn't even know, again, who to talk to about it. There was this brilliant Haitian doctor whose name was, only at Yale Divinity School, Dr. Dieu Like, hi, Dr. Godwills. Good to see you this morning. Brilliant young man. And there would be these huge lines of people paying money, small amounts of money, but paying nonetheless for inc- totally irrelevant care. They had no diagnostics. He was seeing 200 people a day. I was checking blood pressures. And they would go to the pharmacy, where there was no pharmacist, of course, and they would get whatever syrup of the day they were being offered. And I just thought, not only is this young doctor going to crack, but I can't, I can't do it. I couldn't last another f- five months in, under those conditions. And the, the relief that I got, again, this is overly personalized, was by going to Conj. Why? Because there were no medical facilities at all. So to get, to get out of the anxiety caused by seeing substandard care delivered, the best thing for me was getting up to here where there was nothing. And we started again. And we made many mistakes. We had resolved many of them by the time Dr. Ko arrived. <laughs> and um, and we, we had to rebuild the clinic a number of times. Then we built a hospital. But it's not the right way to do things, right? It's like building a house room by room rather than ever having a, uh, I won't say intelligent design. Uh, <laughs> don't worry. I'm, I'm just reading a biography of Darwin, by the way. Not a good idea, intelligent design. Anyway, it's that, that's what we did. We just built room by room. Now, here's some more of the story. By the way, I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> I have at least three more hours to go, right? Speaking of deforestation, by the way, everyone said, well, you know, Haiti's deforested, nothing grows there. Well, you know, it'll grow if you don't, if you can plant it and find alternatives for people to charcoal or to chopping down charcoal for a job, which is what everybody did. So this is more what it looks like now. It's been completely reforested. Again, many of you, some, several of you have been working there. And, you know, it's, we're very proud of it. But it is nonetheless a place that has been built room by room, and not with some master plan. And, and, and that would, would prove very relevant, I will argue, after the quake. Now, Partners Health has spread from these very humble beginnings. I've told you how humble. And it was years before I would actually say, you know, eh, our work wasn't very good. Um, and my first year there was just being witness to some of the worst medical care that I could imagine. And we still have a long way to go, but we've, we've gone from humble beginnings to lots of different places, usually dragged by some pathology, meaning we ended up in Russia because of our work in Haiti, which led us to Peru, and this went on and on. The most deliberate expansion that we've done and thoughtful has been with the Clinton Foundation and several ministries of health in Africa, Rwanda, Malawi, Lesotho. But it took us a, lot, long, t- a long time to get there because we wanted to, we wanted to ha- go in deep rather than broad. I'll I'll show you what I mean by that. So what we learned over these years, again, it's kind of embarrassing to to call a model of care, right? I mean, as another former president of ours might have said, it's not nuclear science. (laughs) I've got to be careful because this is... I'm at Yale. (laughs) So... In any case, here's the, the model. 
tell me if I get this right. Again, I have a number of coworkers here. Community-based care. This is a picture from Rwanda. I, I changed it, and I apologize. I changed my slides like 18 times today. But I like the picture. Um, it's a beautiful photograph. Um, and it pretty much sums it up. You have a patient and a community health worker. And I would argue, as I have publicly in any, any forum I'm offered, that this is the highest standard of care for chronic disease, whether major mental health problems or diabetes or AIDS, you name it, is have a community health worker involved. I, I have a friend of mine, who, a student of mine, who's now an infectious disease doctor in Los Angeles, and I went out to visit her when she was a fellow. That's what they call your uh, stage of training after residency. And um, I went to visit her, and she said, let's talk about some patients. I said, great. She picks me up at the airport. We're talking about patients, and I realized she's telling me about a, a woman with, from Cambodia with AIDS and drug-resistant tuberculosis who lives in a car, homeless. And I said, you know, I don't know how to do this without community health workers. I mean, I know how to do the laboratory work and the diagnostics, but to deliver them without the help of a community health worker is to me not a good idea. I mean, it's better than not delivering care at all. I'll tell you that right now. I'll come out and say it. But really, for high quality care, you need a system. And then the next part of the system is clinic, usually nurse run in our experience. And in Rwanda, Malawi, and Lesotho, um, nur I, would, I mean, nurses are just as rare a commodity as physicians, more or less. But these are nurse run clinics. And then a hospital, I'm kind of proud of to show you this picture. This is, uh, this is a hospital we recently built um, is that, uh, in northern Rwanda. It's quite beautiful. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's, we have even bigger aspirations in Haiti, as you'll see. But that's the model. Now, I could write a whole book about this. In fact, I have. <laughs> However, it's not necessary. It's straightforward, not nuclear science. There are ORs in there, Adrian, I swear. And again, I, I've spent some time on this uh, already. Um, the, the model, and again, this, this is a, a patient of mine, the, the daughter of a friend of mine from the same village, by the way. Do you recognize this person? This is from, a woman from Kai Pan. And uh, the, the same place where someone asked me if Albert Coe was my son. Not that I'm irritated by that. It's not because he's Korean. It's because he's the same age as I am that's bothering me. Hello. So Kaipan, the, the, um, the place that we stopped and took a breather, that's, this, that's, this, that's the house of this woman. The guy's name is Edna Melson, and this is his daughter, who, of course, said I could use her picture any time I wanted. And she was dying, and just like visiting the prisoners, she's dying at home in the summer of 99. Now imagine you're doing what I was doing. It's 1999. Now I've been in Haiti a long time. I've already gone through my training in infectious disease. I'm going from Harvard to Haiti, from Harvard to Haiti. And on the one hand of, the, of that trajectory, everyone's saying it's not cost effective to treat AIDS. And on the other end of the trajectory, we're begging our patients to take their medicines. Is Greg Gonsalves here? Is that a chuckle meaning yes, that he is? No, he should be. Anybody who was around back then knows that this is exactly what was the dominant theme. And when I say around, we're involved in, in public health. It's so not cost effective. To try going from the Brigham and Women's Hospital where you're begging your patients to take their medicines because if they do, they're not going to end up in the hospital, not in the emergency room, not as inpatients. And on the other side of that, saying, well, it's $10,000 per patient per year. It's not cost effective. And again, this is where we learn to say, wait a second, who says it's $10,000 per patient per year? Again, is there, are, there, are there Sumerian tablets in the medicines or something? Because it's true we can't find any more of those. But if there's something that humans made in contemporary humans working in laboratories and pharmaceutical industry, there's a lot that can be done. The average cost, by the way, now is probably around $70 per patient per year with generics. All that has happened in the last decade. So a lot of progress. You, you hear the downside, but at AIDS at 30, this is the 30th year, and some of us have been involved from the beginning. 
It's really a story of scientific progress that was also linked to public health progress. Something that we can be proud of. Anyway, this is the same woman 10 years later. I, I think still on the same regimen, by the way, which is because she has a community health worker, even though she herself works in the health field now with us. 10 years later, giving a speech at Sanders Theater at Harvard. By the way, um, I was... Uh, uh, beforehand, this is the first time she'd ever left Haiti, and uh, she and another guy, who's also still doing fine, his name, by the way, is Saint Carol, Holy Heart. Only the Haitians can come up with such Yale divinity-like names. <laughs> and uh, Ophelia Dahl said to me, you know, maybe you should sit down and talk with them ahead of time, and you know, because they're not used to speaking in front of a thousand people, you know, at Sanders Theater at Harvard. So I said, I said, do you want to go over your remarks? I said, ah, no, we're used to talking. Anyway, what's happening with the political situation in your country? That's what the patient said to me. <laughs> it's stuff's online, I'm sure. You can listen to the two of them giving. I was the translator, and I'm a pretty good translator if I don't say so myself. I've already said that I don't have linguistic skills. And the second guy whose picture isn't here, the Holy Heart, he opened his comments just like this. Huh? I hope there are some Haitians here because it's not as funny. But he said, I'd like to thank all you bourgeois people for coming here today. <laughs> so I get choked up when I think about the earthquake, but at least I have humor. But that was before the earthquake. Now, what about the rest of us? I've talked about medicine and I, 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 I worked on I worked on this talk and made it sort of more, less liberation theology and more medical work. Not because I believe that these first order questions are not key to the work we do, but because I wanted to stay in my own area of competence. But we work with lots of people, even theologians from Yale Divinity School, um, because we know that medicine is only part of the story. If you want to break the cycle of poverty and disease, you're going to end up um, getting involved in people's lives, getting involved in whether or not they have access to credit, to land. Again, we learned that best place to learn this is squatter settlement. And we decided that we would not try to hide these other problems away, but to engage them head on, you know, so-called social determinants of disease. So we'd go into a place, this is Bougancaré, this is after the, uh, some of the arguments were won about whether or not we could treat AIDS. And we'd use that money. Our first grant was from the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, although we were thrilled when the United States followed w with PEPFAR. I mean, that to me is an amazing uh, achievement, PEPFAR, that, that even happened. So we took that money, so-called vertical money, and turned it into health system strengthening. I'm giving a talk about this tomorrow um, at another small community-based college in Cambridge, Massachusetts about the health system strengthening part. And we ended up doing this all across the, the center of the country, from the border at Belladeo to the coast of San Marc. Now, this was all prior to the earthquake. And I just want to say um, that it was really, in every way, the most unpleasant thing that any of us has ever contemplated what was about to happen. And just even now to this day, of course we're still dealing with the fallout in the sense of the fact that a lot, most of the buildings have not been rebuilt. But there was just so much misery to go around right then. I didn't really know anything about earthquakes. I knew about civil conflict, having worked in Peru, at the end of a civil war, when there were still cholera cases there. I, I'd worked in Rwanda, I'd worked in lots of difficult settings. You know, Siberia after the dissolution of the Soviet Union was n not a picnic either. But nothing prepared me or us for what happened on, um, on January 12th. And I just want to use this one image, which I really, I, I, and I'm going to move ahead, but just imagine this is the nursing school the main nursing school of Haiti. And as you, it was 4.53 in the afternoon, so you can imagine there were very few survivors. This is the second year class, 
perished, almost all the members of the second year class and their teachers. So when we talk about building back better, this was only, this is just a couple years ago. And, and, and I, uh, we've made a lot of progress since then, but I have, if I can use this term, a hermeneutic of generosity to those still struggling to make progress in Haiti. You know, we're, we're lucky in the sense that we were outside of the quake zone, where that's where our work was. We also had, a, we lost a lot of friends, a lot of co-workers on that day. Um, at the same time, we did have this team of people already working together. And that made it, uh, it, made it bearable. Let, let me just put it that way. Now, the, the toll of this, some of the visible stuff, it turns out, and again, I didn't know this, but um, earthquakes are notorious, notorious as the most lethal natural disasters. Now, I'm resisting using quotation marks because they're really not natural disasters. There's no such thing as a natural disaster. And that's been, probably been true for couple hundreds of years. I mean, yeah, there may be some islands in the middle of somewhere where something can blow up or a volcano or something, but basically this is not a natural disaster. And I'll, I'll tell you why that's the case. First of all, there's the obvious fact that it doesn't end. I mean, there's a, the earth starts to shake and then it's over, but then come the sequelae. Some of them visible, you know, orthopedic injuries, crush injuries. And again, to all of you from Yale and Connecticut, who came down to Haiti afterwards, you know, it was a great thing. A lot of lives saved. But the reason that this was so difficult, beyond the stench of it, beyond the horror of it, is that it's a huge uh, disaster in terms of lives lost and properties destroyed. And it hit right in the middle of the center of the, the city. So there are some pitiful number of federal buildings in Haiti. I think there were 29 28 of them were destroyed, or damaged or destroyed in the quake. This is the National Palace. You've all, I, mean, I, I imagine most people have seen this image, but it's hard for me to, to know who's seen it and who's not, because, you know, again, we're, we've been in the thick of it. And I remember um, the, one of the aforementioned presidents said, came down there right afterwards, and he said, you know, he'd been saying this ahead before, we need to build back better. And uh, we were in the General Hospital, and I'm talking about President Clinton, and uh, and I th I said, you know, he, he looked at me and said, "You look like you need a shower. Um, do you you know are you guys getting rest?" And I said, "Well, we're doing okay." And I resolved though to ask him privately, did he really think it was possible to build back better? And I did, and he said to me, "Yeah, this is not a slogan. I really believe that." You know, there's, all, there's a chance to make things better than they were before. If you acknowledge that these are long-standing problems and then re-imagine Haiti the way that the Haitians have. And what he meant, I think he was, I know what he meant because I've worked with him a lot. And he meant thinking back to the original idea of Haiti, which was the fight for freedom and the fight for freedom from slavery and tyranny. That beautiful idea is not and by any stretch of the imagination, dead in Haiti. And I'll give you some examples about how we've taken on building that better. First of all, um, actually I tried to change when I wanted to put a picture of my friend Koji in this one. Uh, the, the original response was uh, very inspiring, the acute relief response. A lot of people showed up. You know, more than half of all households, American households, donated to earthquake relief, which I think is a stunning figure says something good. Uh, there's Koji and Evan Lyon and some people you may recognize. Um, it was a very inspiring, uh, just my, and especially my Haitian coworkers. I don't know if you agree, is that they were the most inspiring of all because as rattled as we were, all of us, um, I, I, I think the strongest ones of all were the Haitians, many of, most of whom had lost all, their own family members and friends. This is, um, I'm not sure how to use this because at Harvard they took away my AV privileges because I kept them pointing the lasers at the students when they'd raise their hand. <laughs> so this is really exciting. <laughs> of course, uh, it's been, did you do this? Did you get, did you talk to the people at Harvard? <laughs> anyway, this uh, is Dr. Dr. Lesseg, who is the, dire the, is the director of the General Hospital, 
which was not great before the earthquake, right next door to the nursing school. Nat Natasha Archer is actually a Haitian American who attended this very school. And we just had a lot of people show up, friends from everywhere. Uh, and, and Partners in Health was forever changed by this for reasons both tragic and not so tragic. Tragic because we lost some of our own co-workers, many of our own co-workers and friends. But we also saw this outpouring of generosity. And I got to see it a little bit um, more clearly, perhaps, than some people like Koji who were just... I, I, the first time I went to Conj, when I saw that, went into the church, I just couldn't believe it. Um, I, I went to go see my friends, my Haitian friends. There were a lot of refugees up there, not like the water refugees who had lost their land. But now this place is a medical center, packed with surgeons and anesthesiologists and nurses, and packed with patients. I mean, there were hundreds of patients all over, but again, it was clean. And uh, I, I went to go see my ha the Haitian family, really. I mean, everybody says that. But this is like, these are like my parents in Haiti. I've been living, same people I lived with in 1983, by the way. One, one has since passed away. The other, her husband, an Episcopalian priest, is alive and well. But anyway, I said to uh, Koji, walk me over to see them. And uh, we walk over and I start talking to this priest um, who I've been working with for 30 years. And I look over at Koji and he's sitting in a chair in a very classic Haitian style. The Haitians have a word for this, kage chesla, leaning the chair back. There's one thing that you shouldn't do though if you're going to kage your chair and that is fall dead asleep. <laughs> I said, Koji, hey, we got enough trauma here. Wake up. Well, now I see I've gone and messed up this thing. What do I point at? I was doing so well. Point at a theologian. Did I disable this or something? Of course you don't. You're a theologian. Let's get the uh, early New Testament people. They'll do it. <laughs> An early New Testament person. I You're the no New Testament people. Oh. Jared, Jared. If he can do this, I will s switch Harvard to Yale. <laughs> I'll defect. <laughs> Talk's almost over anyway. No, no, really? Well, let me have that back anyway just for neurosis. <laughs> No flippage is occurring. I'm staying at Harvard. Anyway, you'll let me know when, when the image changes. I just want to say that it was, again, best of times, worst of times. Uh, it was a very difficult... And I'm going to go to this metaphor and then open this up for discussion. The metaphor, again, Build Back Better, which was President Clinton's way of goading us into thinking bigger, and we did. But also... The, the acknowledging the chronicity of the problems. This is what we say in clinical care, that these are acute and chronic problems. So the housing problem was already a disaster. That's why there was so much loss of life in Haiti during the earthquake. You know, if you look at the great earthquake of eastern Japan last year, you know, the, the, the fallout was, of course, not cholera. It was a nuclear disaster. But if that had happened in Haiti, the, the seawall uh, protecting those nuclear power plants is 33 feet tall. And that, the tsunami crested amply a 33 foot tall seawall. But who thinks to build things like that? The Dutch, the Japanese, not the Haitians. You need money. And you need resources to think ahead. So if that would have happened in Haiti, I mean, I, I just can't imagine. 20,000 souls were lost because of that, mostly swept out to sea by the tsunami. But if that had happened in Haiti, and think about all the places where there's such great fragility, and then something like this happens. Next slide. And I, I'll, I'll speed this up. Although you can see that I'm really kind of enjoying myself now. First of all, I arrive late, and I go along. No. No luck. Allie? Last, 
a, a comment, and then we'll, I'll open this up. Cute on chronic. Well, one of the things that we did um, is one of the things you learned about, I said, learn, start in a squatter settlement. Another is, you know, development aid is not supposed to be some sort of pawn in the hands of politicians. Now, I've already praised the Bush administration for PEPFAR, and I, do, I will continue to do so to my dying day. Uh, but American and French and other power, and I'm sure that to some extent the UK, the use of aid is some kind of way to influence foreign policy, very common. In fact, it's probably the common post-colonial pattern. But of course we had a cholera epidemic in Haiti. To use a Haitian expression, it could not happen. Because Haiti was, before the earthquake, the most water insecure country in the world. And a lot of efforts to rebuild Haiti's water system in the years I'd been there, the 30 years I'd been there, had been either poorly implemented or not at all, or they've been blocked as the International Amer the Inter-American Development Bank loans were blocked as a political ploy to unseat the Haitian government. And it worked. So this, this report, um, we published a lot of things. I mean, I also found out that publishing in the Lancet is not a great way to make points in Washington. Nobody reads the Lancet. I do like that we have med downwardly mobile medical journal names, though. The Lancet. You know, I, I was in Atlanta last week, met some of your friends there, and I was, I was thinking about The Lancet. The name of the main hematology journal in the United States is Blood. <laughs> Next slide. So you can imagine what I want to call the gastroenterology journal. I just want to call it Stool. <laughs> but, it's, but its real name is Gut. So we were not confused about what was happening in San Marc on this day. This is from San Marc. I was in Rwanda that day, and I got a call from Louise Ivers, great lady, another infectious disease doctor. Um, tough, too. Dublin, Harvard, skipped over the wimpy Yale part. I'm going to get in trouble for this, I'm sure. But she called me, and she said, there's something terrible happening right now. And, and she told me the scene in, in San Marc, which again is a public hospital, people lined up if they could stand. And so we knew, we knew it was cholera. And I feel bad for the people who predicted in March of this year, again, a f public health experts, not from Haiti, but from another country, doesn't matter which one, but we're standing in it. That, and when they said, cholera is very unlikely in Haiti. Uh, you know, why? Haiti is a product of Europe, Europe's expansion of the new world. It's always been connected into the world system from 1492 on. The original inhabit, inhabitants of Haiti all died. By the time the French came over to bother the Spanish and say this, part, this third of the island is ours, all the natives were gone. Not a single one survived. So how could cholera not happen? And it did. And then came more debates. Again, I've already spit out the debates for you. I said, if something is expensive for poor people, you can bet people will say it's too expensive. Next slide. I swore, by the way, that I would not end on cholera. But I, I will tell you that you know, here, here are a lot of debates about this, but what we made in the, the argument, the next slide actually shows it, that you really have to walk and chew gum at the same time. You, know, you can't just find the cases and treat everybody, although that's the most important thing for doctors and nurses, community health workers to do. You really have to think about municipal water programs, point of care use, linking prevention and care, again, just as we would do with whether looking at AIDS or tuberculosis. But this is already, I'm embarrassed to tell you, ashamed to tell you, that it has gone from a place where there's no cholera at all to the world's largest epidemic. Not per capita, period. Next slide. They had, a, uh, the thing I like about this uh, slide is that it was so hastily cobbled together by the World Health Organization, and I asked for the slide, so hastily cobbled together that they just put arrow pointing to Haiti. Because Haiti is not an endemic site, it's an epidemic, and again, became within probably a few hundred days the largest epidemic in the world. Next slide. Now, one of the things we've been doing, and I'd be glad to take questions about this, 
Um, I, I'm often, when I, every time I go to a divinity school, I get a lot of vaccine cholera questions. <laughs> you know, those theologians and their obsession with cholera vaccine. Anyway, we have launched this program. It took, took too long to launch, but we're trying to do that now, is look forward with ambition to eradication. Now, last, just bef- before you advance the slides, I just want to remind you that I said I grilled President Clinton on this Build Back Better slogan. And um, one of the things that we had already promised to build before the earthquake was a, an, another community hospital, like the ones we built elsewhere, in the town of Mirabale, where, guess where I was 30 years ago? The town of Mirabale. So it meant a lot to me um, to have a good hospital there. And after we built one in a town not too far away, the people of Mirabale had a demonstration and they shut down their own hospital, saying, we're not... We know this is poor quality care. We want Partners in Health to come in and build us a new one. Now, although I deplore demonstrations, I was secretly a little bit pleased because we knew the care was not good there and we wanted to be invited in. And um, I think it's rather charming too, you know. I mean, how serious would you take a death threat if they say, you come and give us medical care, we're going to kill you? So that doesn't make any sense at all. Anyway, we were thrilled to be invited in, but after the earthquake, we really had to do it. We were going to take this seriously, build back better, and we did take it seriously. And we worked, and there's a, one of my former students named David Walton joined a, a uh, became project director. He's from Chicago. Some of you have met him. Um, and he was joined by a Boston guy who had built up a big construction company, which he started, it turns out, when he was 22 years old. And they called Shamit Construction. They built this big company and sold a bit. Very generous, he and his family had been already generous to Partners in Health. But after the earthquake, he more or less moved to Haiti. And he helped us not just reimagine the hospital, as did um, architects from all over, um, but to, 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 to rethink it as if we were going to do something really ambitious, as if we'd had that image of the collapsed nursing school in our minds, to build a real teaching hospital, a medical center. Now you've already seen, you just saw this. Next slide. Here I'm going to close. So this was the new and improved plan. The guy, by the way, the guy who was doing the solar projects, the American solar part of our, uh, in, in Rwanda and Haiti and Les, in Lesotho, Burundi, he died in the earthquake too. I just, you know, he was there on our bidding. You know, he was down there helping us. And, you know, a guy named Walt Ratterman, and a great implementer um, and, and a wonderful person. But I think he'd be really proud if he knew that we had gone from the charrette, the plan to this, uh, to, and that this is not just a plan. Next slide. This is actually built. And... It is going to be, as of probably a month or two from now, the largest solar-powered hospital in the developing world. So thank you all. Thank you, Ali. And I look forward to Q&A. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. We've got a few minutes for questions, a few minutes for questions, and we're going to go ahead and bring uh, the mic up. I thought you were going to ask the question. I was going to say, you know, actually, you, I have you can the mic. ask it, Is it on? There. We can bring in the mic if you have a question. Or I can repeat it if you yell. Or is yelling allowed in Protestant churches? <laughs> Kathy Mallory, yeah. I'd just like to know, could you um, talk about why there's no natural disasters? Thank you. That was, like, that was what we call in tennis, which I don't play, a lob. I was hoping someone would ask me that. You know, I, I, tell, I mentioned already, I was just reading this biography of Darwin, which is interminably long, I might add. And, you know, on the Beagle, the voyage of the Beagle, 
he rounded the coast, uh, I guess, Tierra del Fuego, right? And in Concepcion, in Chile, there was a huge earthquake. And what I mean is that an earthquake doesn't happen in a, in a, or doesn't, it does happen underwater sometimes, away from land, but basically the impact of any disaster, you can measure part of it with the Richter scale, right? The Japanese earthquake was 9.0, but 200 miles off the coast. Um, and the Haitian earthquake was 7.3 on land. But again, the, the real impact in terms of morbidity and mortality loss, it has to do with concentration, quality of construction, how much preparedness there is for an emergency. And that's what I meant by no natural disasters. Is that if you look at, I mean, just, uh, well, I'm going to Shanghai next week. God, I sound like I'm Mr. On the Road, Atlanta. I am. But I'm going to Shanghai, and I've actually been invited by my, uh, prof my mentor, who's a, who's a physician anthropologist named Arthur Kleinman. And he's a, he's a sinologist, he's a China specialist. And he asked me to compare the responses to er two earthquakes. Sichuan, which you guys will remember, 2008, remember all the children who were in school. But what he really wants me to do is look at a 1976 earthquake before any kind of openness in, in his description in, in China. I have to be very careful, of course, to not make exaggerations about things I don't know enough about. But it's so obvious when you start looking at different you know, uh, disasters that we call natural, like Katrina. Or, again, imagine if there had been a 33-foot tall seawall around that part of the Gulf Coast. So that's what I, all I meant. And, and I think it's a good exercise to, to learn from. That's another thing about it. Everyone says, let's learn from these disasters. But we're a short-memoried species. And you know the humanitarian people have a particular brand of ADD. Because, you know, and I'm not saying to those of us in more long-term development do not. But I think, I think it's a problem, learning the lessons and then applying them. So this hospital, by the way, is built to California earthquake standards and then some. But it's also really the first time we've started out not to build something room by room, uh, but actually to, to think, think it through and, and make it right in terms of how, how it's laid out. That's what I meant. I'm a theology student. I'm going to ask you a medical question. Maybe not a good idea. So. You've talked a lot about uh, how poverty um, produces a lot of the sicknesses that you deal with, that, that, that they're coincident. Um, in my experience, this is particularly true with AIDS, that poor people have a lot more HIV than, than otherwise. And, and I'm in complete agreement with what you've had to say about this. But I often find when I try to talk about this that people will come back with lines about how sexual behavior is different in different parts of the world and that that leads to the epidemic. Um, yeah. I, it, based on my own experience, uh, can see the ways in which it is so obvious that poor people with weaker immune systems are naturally going to have, be more susceptible. Um, I'm not always sure, though, what to say in yeah. response to other people like that. How do you encounter those sorts of comments? Well, the good thing is you can always do something really radical and encounter it with data. There's no data to suggest that what happens in here determines the shape of an epidemic. There's plenty of data to suggest that social conditions actually determine the shape of an epidemic like AIDS. So what is I mean by social conditions? Poverty, gender inequality, access to care. The, so that, one, of the thing, one of the problems with arguments like that is that you, you can usually tell when someone's asking you the question or responding to your observation whether they mean to start a conversation or to end it. You can almost always tell. I tell my students at Harvard Medicine, Medical School never spend more than 12.4% of your time arguing. I don't really say that specifically. But what I mean is a lot of times these are not constructive arguments. And what you really need to do is find colleagues to work with you um, I'm, you know, and I mentioned some of the partners we worked with. Obviously, the Haitians. I didn't spend much time on this, but 98 percent of all of the people who did this work are Haitian, and my coworkers are Haitian. 
women's groups, community groups, ACT UP. I'm just talking about uh, President Clinton, the people running PEPFAR. I mean, the number of possibilities for partnership are enormous. But in all those groups, you'll find people making arguments like the one you just did, but those are not supported by good epidemiological data, and quite the contrary. So uh, what I do, just again, you didn't ask me personal advice, but I'm going to give you my, what I do. I write books that no one reads about them, except the random theology professor who pulls one off a shelf. Oh, that was Kidder's book. <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I spend, uh, I spend a, lot, a lot of my time not arguing out loud as I did, you know, and, and I'm, I've got friends, you know, I'm looking at Ann Heisen, and there are many, I've got friends in the audience, you know, who, who know that, you know, I've, I've counseled this to them, too, you know, like, I remember we had these conversations like this right after the quake, you know, so spend some of your time getting the arguments right by reading the, the literature, and then understand you've got to bring people in from all kinds of different places. Most of the time when you hear these arguments, they're really saying more about the person than the topic at hand. And I've tried to be more and more patient as time goes by with people who, I mean, who weren't lucky enough to go to a squatter settlement at the age of 23. Like I said, that's, I didn't have a choice but to learn and figure this stuff out. And then to go to Harvard Medical School and take a PhD. I mean, most people never have a chance to spend time really thinking this through critically. So I, you know, I hear all kinds of stuff like this, even from pr very privileged students who, who ought to know better. I don't get, I don't let it rattle me. I, I really try to bring people in. But, but it is a, I mean, I'm sure you've read my book, Women, Poverty, and AIDS. <laughs> By the way, in an effort to make it more appealing, the subtitle was Sex, Drugs, and Structural Violence. Didn't work. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the point I'm making is that, you know, it's, it's not a bad thing to, to marshal the evidence and and I wrote, you know, again, I write with lots of other people who, who understand social forces. And I think it's worth doing the writing and thinking, but it's also worth being really very open and humane to people who, you know, haven't had the kind of chances we have to, to study, at, you know, in a place like this, for example. Oh, no. I have a question, actually. One more in the yes, sorry. And I feel bad for going on so long. Not real bad, though. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Farmer. My name is Nalpan. I'm a pre-med student, actually. But of course you are. <laughs> and my question is, um, you probably have many things that you would go back and change. Is there anything in your mind that you would go back and do differently? Or you can answer, what advice would you give to a budding pre-med student who wants to help out the poor in, in the yeah. rest of the world? Yeah. And words of encouragement. And third option. No. <laughs> so I, I can choose from a menu of A, B, or C? Sure, if you want. No, I'm... I, First of all, um, I'm glad, I'm, I, hope, I hope a lot of you are interested in medicine uh, in, in, the, in this room and in the other hidden rooms I cannot see. By the way, to all of, the, all of you who found it worthwhile to be in, in an overflow room, I, I really do want to say thank you for wait, first of all, for me being late, waiting for me, but second, for, for s staying. Um, that was, by the way, all just stalling to think about what I'm going to say to a budding pre-med student. One thing, I, I don't know, what year are you? Yeah. Well, one thing it, I, I say to, to people in, in college is to point out that, when I, for example, when I was a sophomore, I, I had said I wanted to be a doctor, but I had no idea why. And I, I, good thing no one asked me, because I, I couldn't have given a, a coherent answer to that question. I hadn't ever been to a doctor, really. I broke my arm once guy who said it was probably under the influence. It's the only time I ever went to a doctor. My, my, my parents, by the way, dispute that, but I guarantee you it's, it's true. They don't dispute the under the influence part, but they, did, they say they took me to the doctor at other times. Um, so I couldn't have answered that. And then also I had never taken, you know, I hadn't taken this class in medical anthropology. When Diana introduced me, she said, I just got started on this in college. I took a great class. And then I went, to I went to college, went to Duke, and I said, I want to be a neurosurgeon. Again, fortunately, no one asked me why. And then I wanted to be a psychiatrist. You know? and, and then I went to Haiti, and I did figure it out. But remember, I had been open to all kinds of things. And one last point I want to make for all of you 
success-oriented folks is the reason I ended up in Haiti is I applied for a Fulbright to go to Senegal. And I thought it was very unlikely that I would ever be turned down for a scholarship. <laughs> and the best thing that ever happened to me was getting that skinny little letter that said, thanks but no thanks. And plan B was Haiti. And I say, can I say this in a church? Thank you, Lord. Anyway, thank you. And I'm stick around for other questions. Thank you so much. <laughs>